1 Samuel chapter 30, I have preached from this text before, but the Lord led upon my heart where you will see me take old messages I have preached long ago, and I will turn them into new ones. But perhaps it might be a good thing where people can compare my old message with the new message. And maybe people might get a blessing out of both. The most famous passage, and I hesitate to use this passage because so many preachers have always used this passage on this topic. But there is no better text than this. So uh, I have to use this passage because there's just no better passage on this topic. Verse 1, And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south, and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. And had taken the women captives that were therein, they slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail the wife of Nabal the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed where the people spake of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord, his God. From this passage, what's going on is that King David returns with his soldiers where he was going to join the Philistines to invade the nation of Israel. But when he returned home and he was able to avoid that invasion, he found out that he lost his wife and that his soldiers lost their family and their houses were burned to the ground and they lost everything. And these men who were used to fighting, who were soldiers, one of them fought against a lion, another one grabbed a spear from another soldier and was able to stab him back with it. These soldiers were mean dudes. They were able to take down giants. So they weren't whiners. They didn't cry easily. You talk about strong soldiers. And now they're weeping like they're little children. Broken down, helpless. So discouraged to the point that they wanted to stone David to death. And in spite of everything that's going on in that turmoil, the Bible says David encouraged himself. You might be a Bible believer and you are soldiers and we're used to getting scars in this wicked Bay Area. Haven't we taken down giants? Haven't we got some good men here who are able to conquer lions and enemies with their spears, with their own spears, and grabbed it from their hands and stabbed them back. Oh, we got some good soldiers here. And we might call ourselves real Bible believers and keep it real and tough. But let's be honest, there are, we can't help it, but there are times that we break down and we weep. And even though we're supposed to be tough, we're supposed to be strong, we have no strength in us and we cannot help but give in to tears, give in to fear, and we can't even help at times but to sometimes even think wrongly of some people. Think wrongly of our Lord. Think about stoning someone to death. And it's so important in the middle of all that you need to be the one to encourage yourself in the Lord. Majority of the time, you're going to find out in your Christian walk and in your war and fight for God that pastor's not there to encourage you, your husband's not there to encourage you, your wife is not there to encourage you, and you don't have brothers and sisters in Christ or a church that will encourage you, and not even God himself will encourage you. Don't get me wrong, he's always in the encouraging business. 
But you're going to find out that you have to encourage yourself in the Lord for Him to start working His encouragement in you. Amen. Amen. And you're going to find out, majority of the time, you alone, by yourself, without God directly intervening or some help in your life, you got to muster up the strength Amen. to encourage yourself. Amen yourself, and I mean that all by your lonesome. And there are too many sermons that have preached this topic. So it's very hard to give you something new from this. But there is so much in here, and I would like to dare take a stab at it and give you some things that you probably didn't hear from other sermons. Some of them you probably did hear, but it could be something worth repeating. Will you pray with me? Father, fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and the cleansing of your blood to preach. Oh God, unlike other messages, make this sermon something new, unique, not because this is something better, but because it's been told by people before and they need to hear something different. And your word is endless, I strongly believe that the same old verse, you can preach 50 different things or even more. Do so in this message so that people will not have the excuse that, well, I've heard that sermon before, so then they lose the conviction. I pray that will not be the case. I pray that we will encourage ourselves in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now in verse 1, the Bible says, <clears throat> and it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. What was David doing in Ziklag? You know, that's the city of the Philistines. So you know his heart was not right with God when him and his soldiers were staying there, residing in the city of Ziklag. And you know, sin has a price to pay. Sin has a cost. So wasn't it bound to happen that David would lose everybody in a moment of time? That his wife would suffer? That his men would suffer? For his sin that he committed against God? He deserved it. So why should he encourage himself in the Lord when he sinned and messed up? Now you have heard some preachers mentioning about that at verse 1. And that's why it's hard for you to encourage yourself in the Lord because you deserve it. You deserve the pain. You deserve the suffering. Sin has a price to pay. Eventually it was going to catch up with you. So how can you encourage yourself after that? Many preachers have mentioned about that at verse 1. And they said that you still got to encourage yourself, which has been very helpful. But I like to add something more complicated here. I like to add another layer. You know that when you sin and mess up, and these bad things happen, that you should still take heart, encourage yourself in the Lord, plead the blood of Christ, and move on with your life. Amen. You all know that. You all know that. Yeah. But it's still hard to do it because the discouragement is so great yeah. over the sin that you committed against God, and that's another price of sin. It adds another complex layer. I would like to tell you that it's not easy, it's not that easy to plead the blood of Christ and move on with your life. I would like to tell you and sympathize and agree with you that it's hard to look at those things which are before and put those things behind. Easier said than done. I get that because in this case right here, it's a lot more complicated when you think. When you think about the sin that you messed up, See, what you're thinking about is the mistake that I made. And when you're focused about the mistake that you made, it's very hard to encourage yourself in the Lord. Because it's your fault, your fault, your fault. Amen. And you deserve it. 
How can anyone get over that? But it gets more complicated. Look at right here. When you're at fault, it starts to combine with other negative things. Here's a bad one. Look at verse 1. Came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag, when? On the third day that the Amalekites had invaded. So think about this. It was at the third day when they arrived at Ziklag that the Amalekites took away all their families. That was when the bad thing happened. If you were to look behind, if you were to look behind at verse 13, 13. And David said unto him, To whom belongest thou, and whence art thou? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite. And my, la my master left me because three days ago and I fell sick. We made an invasion upon the south. Notice from this text that David and his soldiers later on, they were able to come across an Egyptian. And this Egyptian was a servant to those Amalekite invaders. And that Egyptian servant clued in on them that it was at the third that three days have passed. And before then, that was when the Amalekites invaded. So think about this. It was at that third day, it was the third day or probably three days ago that the Amalekites had invaded. Now think about this. They're all the way here with the Philistine soldiers, right? If you rewind back the clock before they went to Ziklag, they were with the Philistine soldiers making an invasion on the nation of Israel. If you were them, and you saw your house burned to the ground and your wife taken and your children gone because of your mistake, your mistake that you made, what happens when you start thinking about your mistake? You start to think of possibilities. You start to think, I could have. I could have. I could have left maybe just a couple hours earlier or a day prior if I just went a little earlier, I would have made it to Ziklag in time. And I would have prevented those Amalekites from taking my family. I could have. If only we went a little faster to Ziklag. If I just pushed myself a little harder, then I know I could have done it. I have the ability to do it, and I could have done it. If I just went a little faster to Ziklag, I could have gotten there earlier and prevented that mess from happening. If only I was one day short, just one day less. I could have done this. I could have done that. And you know what? That bothers their minds. What's worse is when you commit sin against God and it's hard to encourage yourself, you combine it with, I could have done this earlier. I could have stopped sinning earlier. I could have just had more faith in God. I could have pushed myself a little harder against that sin. Pushed myself a little harder to serve God better in that. But because I've done that, a lost loved one in my life is now dead and probably burning in hell right now. Because of that, I am reaping what I've sown and my family is suffering for it. And those Amalekites are having their way with my family, because of my selfishness. Oh, if only I, I should have listened a long time ago. Amen. I could have done that a long time ago. And when that happens to you, that is why it's hard to encourage yourself, because sure, you can plead the blood, put it behind you, and God can easily forget it, but you can't easily forget it. Amen. Because you're thinking about, it was my fault, I could have, I could have done that, I could have, if only I did this, then it would have rescued me from that problem. Amen. Yet the Bible says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord. Amen. In the midst of his sin, in the midst of, I could have done that better, 
I should have pushed myself a little harder. I should have gotten right with God a long time ago. He didn't think about all that. He just encouraged himself in the Lord and moved on with his life. Amen. You know what would have happened if David didn't encourage himself in the Lord? We read that passage. In verse 13, we read that passage. They were able to come across an Egyptian servant. They were able to look in verse 11, verse 11, and they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread and he did eat and they made him drink water. You will notice right here that he mentioned in verse 13, and David said to him, to whom belongest thou and whence art thou? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite, and my master left me because three days ago I fell sick. That Egyptian servant was going to die. He had no food, no water. And when did that happen? That happened at the same timing, three days, the same timing when David made that mistake. The same time that David said, if only I did that better. But guess what? Because of his mistake, listen, because of that mistake he made, he was able to meet that Egyptian servant and save his life. Let's say he came a day less. Oh, I could have done that better. Oh, I should have pushed myself a little harder. If he missed off by one day, then he would have missed out helping that Egyptian servant. And that Egyptian servant could have laid down on the road and died. And I know that you can think of a million things. Well, I should have done that. I could have done that. I should have pushed myself a little harder. You might be one day short then of helping and saving somebody's life along the way from your mistake. Didn't you know that your mistakes that you committed and the sins that you've done against God, that they will minister to somebody else who is sick and dying along the road and they just need someone to tell them that I went through the same struggles as you. I made the same stupid mistake like you did. I lost a loved one just like you. And they need someone to tell them that because there are Egyptians stuck in the land of Egypt which represents the world and there are lost sinners in this lost world who are dying and stranded along the road and they don't need someone who's more holier than thou than them, someone who's better than them. They need someone just like them. Someone who suffered and made the same stupid mistakes just like them. And brother and sister in Christ, that mistake that you made might be a God-ordained timeline where it will match Three days, the right time to minister to somebody else who made the same mistake like you. So you should have pushed harder, then maybe you wouldn't minister to that person. Then maybe you couldn't relate to that person and help him or her out. That's why you should encourage yourself in the Lord. Why? Because there's a lot of Egyptians stranded on the road and they need someone to minister to them from your mistakes. They need to hear your mistakes. They need your mistakes put to good use for the glory of God and who knows, you might save somebody's life. Amen. Can I tell you this? Perhaps 90% of me counseling to people, minister to people, the 90% that I've done and was able to help them was because of my mistakes. Not because I pushed harder. Not because that I've avoided sin. Not because I've done something right for God. It was from my mistakes. You know why you should encourage yourself in the Lord after you've sinned? 
after you messed up? When you could have done better and obviously I'm not telling you to sin. Obviously I'm not saying never feel guilty or to repent. But guess what? You could have think a thousand times, well, I shouldn't have done that. I should have never touched that. I shouldn't have done that. That can go on endlessly. But why don't you pick yourself back up, encourage yourself in the Lord and say, I'm going to use that to rescue some Egyptian out there. Let's look at verse 3. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept. You'll notice in verse 2, I didn't read that part. And had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. David lost his whole family, city, burned to the ground, and yet in the middle of that emotional turmoil, he was able to somehow find the strength and have the resources to get a grip on himself and encourage himself in the Lord his God. I wonder where he got such strength. I wonder why he was able to do that. Maybe, just maybe, because the Bible says that they slew not any. Maybe, just maybe, because he's thinking, I can get my wife back. Maybe, just maybe, because, oh, thank God that they only burn my house to the ground and not kill my family. Maybe, just maybe, because... Not everything in my life is taken away from me. Not anything is killed. It's just taken captive. Amen. Maybe, just maybe, you can encourage yourself in the Lord when your whole family is taken away from you and everything's burned to the ground that you would say, the devil didn't kill my salvation. Maybe, just maybe, you can encourage yourself in the Lord that I messed up a thousand times, but the devil never killed the power of 1 John 1, 7 through 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Maybe, just maybe, because of that, you can find the strength to encourage yourself Amen. in the Lord. Maybe, just maybe, that even though the devil has taken away people in your life and they've turned against you and talked about stoning you to death, that there were other people in your life that God has given. What about your husband, your wife next to your side? And those of you who don't have that, what about your brother and sister in Christ in this church. And if for any of you who don't have any of that, what about Jesus Christ who is in your heart and in your life? They can't kill that. They never killed that. They never slew it to the ground. You still got it. And maybe, just maybe, you can grab a hold of yourself and encourage yourself in the Lord that, hey, I still got my salvation. I still got my Jesus. I still got a Bible-believing church. I still have His Word. I still have the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I still got a roof over my head. I still got food to eat. I still got blessing number one and blessing number two and blessing number three. Oh, I counted my many blessings and I realized nothing has actually, be, actually been really taken away from me. Amen. Amen. Triple amen. Maybe, just maybe... You can encourage yourself if you were to cling on to some hope. Some hope that I know that thing has been taken away and captured, but God can use it for good. But God can restore something out of that. Maybe David, that's why he was able to encourage himself when he thought about his wives being captured, but clinging on to the hope that they can be restored. Amen. 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 
maybe the Lord can restore something out of that broken tragedy, give you back something more precious and valuable. And that's why you can encourage yourself in the Lord. You'll notice at verse 4, Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, uh, Hinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. <clears throat> they were in such distress, David and the soldiers. His two wives were taken captives. He lost his whole family. And with the city burned to the ground and you feel like that you've got nothing and you're just broken and so much in hurt and grief that you can't help but cry and weep. And in spite of all that heartbrokenness that your mind and your heart and your body functions can only sense and feel and it's not thinking about prayer, it's not thinking about faith, it's not thinking about being a blessing to someone, it's not thinking about anything else but just negative and negativity filling up everything in your mind and in your heart. And yet David found the courage, found the strength to be able to encourage himself in the Lord. Did you notice right here that he did not encourage himself in the Lord at verse 1? Did you notice that? When Ziklag was burned to the ground, he didn't encourage himself in the Lord right then. Did you notice when you read the previous chapters, there's not much about David encouraging himself in the Lord. He was in Ziklag. And if you read some of the chapters in the book of Psalm, he was very depressed. He wrote some of those Psalm while living in Ziklag. And when you read it, he felt lonely. He felt depressed. He felt miserable and that all the enemies and even his loved ones and family members were all turning against him. You hardly see encouragement and joy in there. Don't get me wrong. There are times when David will try to remind himself about the Lord and sing his praises. But you can't help but just see backslidden condition, guilt, depression and loneliness. You hardly see him encouraging himself in the Lord until the Bible says, ain't this something? Until they had no more power to weep. Until he lost the energy and the strength to weep. Until he lost the energy and the strength to stay miserable. Until he lost the energy and the strength of feeling loneliness. Until he lost the energy and the strength of feeling sad, 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 sad. But until all of that power and that ability was drained away, then he realized there was nothing more that he can do except to encourage himself Amen. in the Lord his God. You know why, brother and sister in Christ, you're still depressed and you cannot encourage yourself anymore because you still got a lot of power to stay depressed. You know why, brother and sister in Christ, that you feel so lonely and you cannot encourage yourself anymore? You still got power to stay lonely. You know why, brother and sister in Christ, you cannot encourage yourself when guilt controls your mind after you sin? Because you still have a lot of power to put guilt on yourself. You know why you cannot encourage yourself in the Lord and there are people who just commit suicide and end it all? Because they have the ability to kill and take away their own life. But when all of that is taken away from you and God does not afford you the chance to be miserable, depressed, or to even kill yourself, and didn't you remember those times when God just never gave you that chance? <laughs> Lord, I want to quit. I want to run away. And God just put you in a trap position and took that away from you. No, you can't run away. There's no turning back. 
you got only this road ahead to do for me. And thank God he took away your power. Thank God he took away the power for you to mess up your own life, to stay depressed, to be lonely, and to give up on God. Oh, I thank you, God, that many times you took away my power and you put me in a trap position that I had no choice but to encourage myself in you. You know when you're going to encourage yourself again? When you lose the power to weep. When your mind can't think anymore of negative thoughts because it's just so heavy and sick and tired of it. When your heart is just so much used to feeling broken, it becomes immune and gets over with. Until you have no more power to weep, then maybe you're going to look at your shelf, pick up that book, and read the Bible, and encourage yourself in the Lord. You still got a lot of power to get mad at God? You still have a lot of power to weep tears? You still have a lot of power to think negative thoughts? You still got a lot of power to have negative feelings? I tell you what, brother, if you got plenty of power to do that, then you're going to last a long, long time until you finally encourage yourself in the Lord. It's time to relinquish that power and let God take it away from your life and surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit where there is love, joy, and peace. Look at verse 6. And David was greatly distressed. For the people spake of stoning him. Because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Did you notice what the Holy Spirit wrote there? If he did not write that down, a lot of preachers... I would dare say, would not preach out of 1 Samuel 30 for this topic. There was one word that made a huge difference that's become become the main passage that preachers have preached. You'll notice that says David encouraged himself. That's probably the most important word that made this sermon famous than the word encouraged than the words in the Lord, believe it or not. It was himself. That's what made in the Lord better. That's what made encouraged better. Because I can point out a lot of sermons that says encourage or in the Lord. There are plenty of verses for that, but not with himself. Did you notice that the Bible, isn't it interesting? The author never said David encouraged, was encouraged in the Lord is God. Did you notice that? The Bible never said David was encouraged in the Lord his God. That would be correct. There would be nothing wrong with that. That David was able to receive courage because of God and because of his promise. And it's all because of him. That makes good stuff. But none of that would make any good if himself is not a part of it. That word made a huge difference that changed everything. If you don't believe me, then let's drop himself. And let's think about encouraged in the Lord. If I were to say he was encouraged in the Lord, and in the Lord contains his promises. Praise the Lord, 100 promises of God. Praise the Lord that he will never leave you nor forsake you. Praise the Lord that God gives you grace to help in time of need. Praise God, in the Lord is all the encouragement you need. But guess what? No matter how much God encourages you, you can discourage yourself. You know who's the greatest discouragement? The greatest discourager? It's not the devil. Can I repeat that again? It's not the devil. It's not the trial that you're going through. Oh, if only this pain would go away, then I would be happy. Really? 
I can show you plenty of cases where okay. rich people don't have problems and then they're not happy. Yeah. Oh, if only God would just make this easier for me. Easier? We live in America. We got it easier than third world countries. You're not happy. God can, God can bless your life and have your cup overflowing, and some of you are already having it, and yet you still discourage yourself. What more God can do? I mean, you've seen the miracles in this ministry. You've seen the miracles in your own personal, individual life that God did something that he didn't do with any other person, and yet you still discourage yourself? So it ain't God that needs to encourage you. You need to encourage yourself. The one that needs to get out of the way is you because you are the biggest discourager and you need to get that discouragement called you out of the way and start encouraging yourself. You don't need Pastor Kim to preach and preach encouragement to you until you feel encouraged. What you need to do is you need to take that word and encourage yourself because some of you are still discouraging yourselves right now while I'm preaching encouragement at you. Now die to yourself. Get yourself out of the way and start encouraging yourself and say, that's right. Say amen. Get on the altar. Get right with God. I don't care if it's even right now. You need to encourage yourself in the Lord. Encourage yourself. There's a problem going on with you that the devil's putting boundaries on. God don't need to encourage you anymore because you'll just discourage yourself out of a blessing. That's why the Bible says he encouraged himself. He encouraged himself in the Lord. Notice in verse 7. And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. <laughs> Can you uh, picture what's going on over here? He got the ephod. Man, that's something that Saul wanted desperately. Because if you go to Israel, compared to David and Ziklag, Saul was trying to get an answer from God and God won't talk to him. He doesn't have the ephod where he can communicate with God and he lost it. God took that away from him. But you know who got it? The one who got it is David. Now, in the middle of all that turmoil and problem, David, he could have just went to the ephod a long time ago and communicated with God, couldn't he? Let me tell you something even more mind-boggling. Abiathar is the priest who is carrying the ephod. He could have had any time, any moment, communicated with God, perhaps, right? I mean, he was carrying the ephod. He could have just said, Lord, what am I going to do? But ain't it something, man? Abiathar never communicated with God once throughout that whole time where they were weeping until they had no more power to weep. If they were weeping that hard, that's got to be hours probably, right? Yeah. Hours and hours long when Abiathar could have just a long time ago communicated with God through the ephod. But so much needless energy was wasted, needless tears shed until David said, let's talk to God in the ephod. So you know what, Abiathar never even used the ephod. <laughs> Get that, huh? All that time. David, he had the courage where Abiathar failed to use a resource from God to be happy. And David had the courage to still Go to that resource. Hey, Abiathar, if you're not going to get a grip on yourself, then I'm going to do it. Bring me the ephod. 
David had the courage to believe that when I use that ephod, I'm going to communicate with God. The verse said he encouraged himself in the Lord and consulted for the ephod. Yes? David, that means, realized his encouragement through the power of the ephod in communicating with God. And he had the courage to say, hey, Abiathar, if you're not going to receive any encouragement out of that ephod, then I am going to do it. What's so important about that, preacher? Well, David, he could have thought, well, I guess the ephod is not encouraging Abiathar. I guess Abiathar is not going to communicate with God over it, so why should I do it? Why should I use the ephod? Why should I consult it? Hey, maybe, just maybe, I'm just wondering here. But maybe David was probably thinking, you know, why is Abiathar weeping so hard when he's got the ephod all that time? Maybe the ephod wasn't helping him. Maybe he did use the ephod, but God's not answering. So why would God answer me when I'm not the high priest in charge of the ephod? You know what gets people to stay encouraged? I mean, discouraged, excuse me. You know what gets people discouraged? You know what prevents people from encouraging themselves? When they see other brothers and sisters in Christ who got the resources to encourage themselves to have the joy of the Lord, but it's not working for them. But they're not using it. You know why you're not happy in Him singing? And that's not a resource that's giving you joy? Because other people are sad when they're singing hymns and that's not been a good resource for them. So why should you bother to be happy? Why should you bother to sing praise and say amen when nobody else is saying amen? When nobody else is happy? When everybody else is sad? Somebody's mood, get this, people's mood affects you. And when there's a brother and sister in Christ that says, I prayed about it, but I'm still struggling and God's not been helping me, what do you think that's going to do with you? I thought that you pray a lot, but if the Lord's not helping you, then why should I even bow my knees and pray? You know what gets to me? If I come to this church and I'm not happy in the Lord, what do you think my members are going to think? Here's pastor, he knows all of Bible-believing truth. He's been through the lot, a, a lot, and God has taught him so many things. He blessed him with so much resource, but I guess none of those things have been blessing him. None of those things have been helping him. So if they don't help him at all, and pastor quits the ministry, why should I bother? Why should I bother being a Bible-believer? Boy, that gets to me. Hey, mom and dad. You're going to complain and stay depressed? What do you think your kids are going to think? Okay. Okay. Oh, uh, I can't serve God. I can't be faithful being a Bible believer. I get, just, get so discouraged. What do you think you're going to do with your kids? Stop being selfish about yourself and think, look after your next generation, your kids. Yes. Yes. Hey, you grown adults, we got kids in here. I don't care if you don't have kids. They're looking at you. Okay. And when you come in without the joy of the Lord and you get discouraged, you're going to make them seek after the world more because they think the world is the place to give them joy because here it is, Bible-believing church, Bible-believing truth, not giving you any encouragement. You know what you need to do? And I don't care if pastor's in a bad mood that day. And I don't care if people in here feel defeated. You need to walk in and like David, you need to tell those Abiathars, hey, let's seek after the Urim and Thummim. Let's pick up the ephod. Hey man, I got a thousand songs here from this ephod. Hey,
Hey, this ephod here is a pretty good place where we can fellowship together. Hey, this ephod is working for me. Uh, yeah, I can communicate with God. I can have joy with God. It's working for me. Man, that ephod was a blessing. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. That ephod is sure good. Hey, Abiathar, if you ain't going to get a blessing out of it, I'm not going to let you steal my blessing from it. And if some brother and sister walks out of this church and they don't come back to this church because they're just so discouraged and depressed, don't let that infect you. Yes, don't give up. You be the one walk in. Yes. But you know what? There are people walking out of this church and that's influencing you to walk out of church too. I've up. seen it. I've seen it. It's like a deck of cards. It's infectious. Don't give up. Don't give up. If someone is stuck with a sin problem and they can't get victory over it, don't you get discouraged and say, man, I can't beat my sin. I can't defeat it. You don't be that one. That ephod works. God has given you an ephod. Now use the resource. I'll tell you why you're not using the ephod. David, he had to ask Abiathar for the ephod, right? Did you notice that? Verse uh, 7, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. Do you know how uncomfortable that was for David? You might say, why is that uncomfortable? Because, did you read verse 6? The people spake of stoning him. Did you read verse 1? He was in a place of sin. Do you know how uncomfortable he was when people hated his guts and people know that because of his mess up, because of his sin, that their wives and their children have been taken away? So do you think David is comfortable enough to go to Abiathar and say, hey, get encouraged in the Lord. Give me the ephod. <laughs> no way, man. You can imagine a, probably a very awkward feeling or fear in his mind. But listen, he had to go through something uncomfortable. He had to get over the uncomfortable part to get his ephod to receive the encouragement. I know why you're not using your ephod. I know why you're not going through the ephod. I know why you're not coming to this ephod, to this church. I know why. I know why. It's too uncomfortable for you. Come on, uh, you're lying to yourself if you say it's comfortable to just read your Bible faithfully every day and receive encouragement from God. You're kidding me if you say that, well, uh, I just want a fellowship with the brethren, so I have to drive through the crazy traffic of the Bay Area. I got to sacrifice time out of my busy schedule so I can receive encouragement through fellowship with the brethren. Some of you had to take Uber and Lyft to get over here. Some of you had to pay extra money, not just extra time, extra money. You think it was easy for me to make time for this? It's so uncomfortable, which is why we're not willing to take the ephod for our encouragement, because it's just too uncomfortable. But you need to get over that. You need to get over that uncomfortable feeling, those uncomfortable thoughts flooding your mind. Hey, David, stop thinking about how awkward it is, how uncomfortable it is, and how much that your flesh doesn't have the strength to do it. Or if you're uh, uh, incapable and you don't have the strength and the ability. No, no, get over that and go through that uncomfortable thing and get your ephah. I don't care how heavy your flesh feels. Get over that uncomfortable hump and get your ephod and have the Lord speak to you. Aren't you glad that you got your ephod today? Aren't some of you glad that aren't some of you glad that you went over over your uncomfortable thing to get your ephod today? Verse 8, the Bible says, And David inquired at the Lord, 
saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. This is my last text. I am aware of the time. <coughs> David asked God, Should I pursue after this troop? Are you kidding me, David? These are the Amalekites. Did you read chapter 27? If you read chapter 27, David and his men were mean, bad dudes, and they whooped those Amalekites. But here they are, and they're like, should I fight against the Amalekites? If I were them, look, you thought about this. Here you are, you walk inside your house, and here are a couple punks who just raided your house. What are you going to do, cry like a little girl and say, oh, it's all taken away from me? If you have the ability to whoop their tails? I'll tell you what you'll do, especially if you have the resources of a cop or with government control. If someone raided your house, you'd be stinking mad, not crying, and you'd be stinking mad and use those resources and whip their tails. Amen. Who would give the... <laughs> Who would say something like, oh, should I fight? Oh, oh should I... Yeah, On the world, man. Yeah, so... Why did David, look, why did David give a dumb question like that? He could easily whoop their tails. Because that's what discouragement does. It's so complicated, unexplainable. And God promised you he wouldn't give you a burden greater than you can bear. And all of you have the strength and the ability to whoop that incident. You're not the only one. There are millions of others who went through problems like you and they were able to whoop them and you can whoop them. But discouragement is just so stinking heavy that you can't help but doubt yourself and say, oh, should I keep pursuing? Should I keep fighting? Right? That's how horrible discouragement is. And you know what God answers? Did you see that? Look at that verse. He says, pursue. He says, fight. Go after those enemies and fight. Did you read the next verses? The discouragement is a real thing. It's a horrible thing. Sometimes it's more hurtful than physical pain. Discouragement is real. It is that real, it is that horrible that David's strong and mighty men who were able to defeat giants and lions. The Bible says that when they pursued after the Amalekites, there were hundreds of them who were so worn out that David had to leave them behind. God was telling David, Pursue. Here the soldiers are. I'm so weak. I can't fight. And you're telling me that I got to keep on fighting? I don't have the strength to pursue. And the Bible shows right there that the, the path was so long, so hard on that fight, and the soldiers were already worn out with discouragement that they said, David, I, I really can't. I can't go any longer. I can't pursue. I need to sit down and stay. I can't help it. When God tells you to pursue and fight, that's how you feel, don't you? That you can't fight anymore. That's how tired you are. And I know you got the ability, you got the strength because God promised it. But let's just be flesh and real here. I just can't keep going on. I can't pursue. But that verse says, if you look back, he says, pursue for without fail. I'll make sure you recover all. You know why God told David to fight? He didn't say just fight and that's it. He didn't say fight because you're supposed to be a strong soldier. He never said fight 
because, hey, that was your fault to begin with, your sin, so you got to clean it up. He never said that. He says, fight so that I can heal you, Amen. I can bless you, Amen. I can restore you. Amen. You know why God tells you to fight, David? Not because he's mean. And he never just said, just fight. He never said that. He said, fight so I can help you. Amen. Fight so I can recover you. Yeah. Fight so that you can succeed something in life. Amen. God never said, fight because, hey, it's your fault to begin with. It's your mess, so you better clean it up. No, he never said that. He never said fight because, hey, stop being a wimp. You're strong. You got the strength. Pick yourself back up and just fight. He never did that to you. God was so gentle, merciful, understanding. And he was able to overlook all your imperfections and just say, hey, child, just fight against the flesh. Just fight against the discouragement. Just fight against the world. Just keep fighting the demonic attack so that I can do something great with your life. That's why you have to fight. Do you understand? Listen, you have to fight so that you can recover. That verse said, pursue so that without fail, you recover. Amen. You want to recover? Then fight. You want to recover? Then fight! You know how you're going to encourage yourself in the Lord? It's a battle. It's a war. It's not something easy. It's not something that put people put energy into you. It's not inspiration or motivation. It takes war. It takes fighting. You need to fight to encourage yourself so that God can bless your life. God can recover you. God can do something and so that you don't fail. That's why you need to fight. If you want to be encouraged, then you need to fight. Fight. Fight for your life. Fight for happiness. Fight for recovery. Fight for peace in your home. You know why you need to come out down on the altar today? So that you can fight. You need to fight and you will encourage yourself in the Lord. Encourage yourself in the Lord by fighting for it. Gritting your teeth for it. It takes war to encourage yourself. You want encouragement? Do you want encouragement? Then you need to be a warrior soldier. Buckle up and fight for it. And let God do wonderful things in this church after this. Every head bow and every eye shut.